Welcome out to church tonight. Thanks for joining us online. We're going to sing the song, We Have a Vision. Let's all stand in this place. We have a vision for this nation. We share a dream for this land. We join the angels in celebration. And by faith we speak revival to this land where we need, where every knee shall bow and worship you. And every tongue confess that you are Lord. Give us an open heaven, anoint our prayers this day, and move your sovereign hand across this nation. We have a vision. We have a vision for this nation. We share a dream for this land. We join with angels in celebration. And by faith we speak revival to this land. Where every knee shall bow and worship you. Thank you. 
too hard for you, my God. If you are for us, you could be against us. God, we give you praise and thanks, Lord God, for your help, Lord God, for your involvement in our lives, Lord God. God, there's no Let's give him praise and the club offering to us. Let's give him all the glory and the presence of God's spirit. We want to pray a few things. We want to lift up. We want to pray for our marriages. We want to pray for the outreach, uh, the big day outreach coming up on Saturday. We want to pray for evangelists, God to use them. Uh, also just got a uh, communication with Pastor Gibson. He's over in the Philippines and you know we get our uh, prayer calendar for New South Wales for the evangelists etc. It makes a difference. Your prayers make a difference and uh, he covets our prayers here. Uh, church number 120 Plus, people got saved with many people filled the Holy Ghost. Uh, the following uh, church, they had 70 plus just in one night at the crusade, in the outdoor crusade. Countless uh, miracles, people's lives touched. The third church has seen more than those other churches, people responding. Just great stuff happening in their churches. The Philippines church, he sent me a, uh, a photo of their notice board, or in fact their overhead it was, and uh, they're praying for missionaries. And then there's like all of these nations all throughout Asia, probably a dozen different nations. Some of them I haven't even heard of, but uh, they have missionaries there that they've planted out of these Philippine churches. God's moving in the Philippines right now. Let's pray for those churches tonight. Let's take time to pray for this service. God, give me something that I can take away and use in my life and something I can take away and share with somebody else tonight. Let's take time and pray. Let's invite the Holy Ghost to have his way in our service tonight. I'm going to get Stu to open us in a word of prayer in just a moment. Father, we are thankful, Lord, Lord, to come in and God worship and praise you, Lord God. Lord God, be amongst your people, Lord God. Be God, I believe hear your word, Lord God, that can change our life, God. We can uh, transform our situations, Lord. We do want to pray, my God, for our Christian marriages. God, we want to pray for all marriages in this city, God. We want to pray, Lord God, your uh, promises come to fruition, God. We pray, Lord. Father, God, we thank you, God, for your presence here tonight, God. God, we lift up a uh, Pastor Gibson to you, God, and pray, God, that you would use him, God, in the realm of the supernatural, God. God, that the signs and wonders would follow the preaching, God. I lift up to you the Filipino churches, God, and missionaries, God. I pray, God, that there would be enough funds, God, to be able to. Um, fund all that you want to do, God, in that nation, God, that there would be enough workers, God, to be able to meet the need, God, in that nation, God. And I pray, Heavenly Father, God, tonight that you would speak to us, God, a word in season for our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Great to see you here. Take a moment to greet someone tonight. Well, I've got a couple of announcements. I want to uh, bring to you uh, prayer and fasting Friday. <laughs> Prayer night, Friday night at the um, uh, the relevant home groups. I encourage you to fast, to pray, to make a difference, uh, and to gather on Friday night. That'll be a great time. There'll be, I'm sure, some uh, some some food at the end of all of that. Praise God. There's a big day outreach on Saturday. It's a it's a big deal. Um, it's an opportunity. Twelve uh, Pioneer Works in Sydney will have teams turning up to uh, minister on the streets in those suburbs. People bringing guitars, people testifying on the streets, and there's a rally, a youth rally in the evening with uh, Pastor Dan Stefan from um, uh, Auckland, New Zealand. Seeing great things in his church over there, real breakthrough in that church, 
and uh, there's stuff happening. And so they're hoping to kickstart. They're hoping to continue to move forward with some of the churches. There's good stuff happening down in Sydney. Going to get a few reports on uh, Sunday morning from uh, our guys that are going down. And uh, we're excited to be part of a fellowship that has a vision. And we sang that song, We Have a Vision. We have a vision. Can you say amen? amen. For, uh, for our city, for our family, for our own life, for the nations. And uh, that's way, way beyond anything I would have dreamt up for my life. I would have been very caught up in my own little world. But God has lifted the veil and said there, there, there are souls that you can reach. There's something that you can do. You can play a part in, uh, in the team that God's put together in this fellowship to reach the world. And we're literally reaching the world. And uh, thank God for that. Praise God for his goodness to be part of that. We can take an offering tonight for uh, God's work here in the church, obviously for the Pullman work, the support there, making a difference in another nation, somebody's life it can be, will be changed. And uh, we can, as we go over next year, we'll see that for ourselves. Uh, if we're able to do that. If not, we'll get some video for you and show you that, but uh, get some testimonies. How exciting is that? Praise God. Praise God for his goodness. Can you get Josh to pray with this offering? Father God, we do thank you for your provision in our lives and that we can rely on you in these uncertain times instead of relying on our money. God, I pray tonight that you will bless the gift and the giver in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Praise God. And as I promised um, last uh, Wednesday night, I'm going to do a follow-up uh, message. And uh, I preached last Wednesday night the truth about heaven and uh, I'd encourage you to include that in your testimony, in your witness to people. Tell them about heaven. People need a, a vision that's beyond this life. These people that they know their time is short. These people that are, you know, uh, looking, well, what's next? What's happening? And, and, and if this life is all there is, the Apostle Paul says, we're, we're pitiable. That there's more than just this life. There is a heaven to go to. But the other side of the coin, and heaven is, if you like, a carrot. Heaven is, if you like, something we can look forward to, something that entices us. Yeah, I want to go to heaven. And so we receive Jesus in our life. We want to be forgiven of our sins. We want to make heaven our home. Heaven's a perfect place. There's no more sorrow. There's no more tears. There's no more sickness. There's no more death. It's like, come on, bring on heaven. But uh, the Bible also, if you like it, uh, it gives us another side of the coin also to uh, hopefully inspire us to want to make heaven our home. And it's the truth and the teaching about hell. And so I want to minister the truth about hell tonight from Luke 16. And by way of introduction, there's very simply two simple truths about hell. Number one is it's real. And number two is you don't want to go there. Hell is a real place and you don't want to go there. Luke 16, we're going to start in verse 19. Luke 16, verse 19. Jesus speaks and it's a, it's a parable and he says it's a story and he illustrates some things through this story. He says, There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. Jesus is addressing the Pharisees and the Pharisees were right into money, they were right into prestige, they were right into appearances, they were right into, you know, and there's nothing wrong with having money or having nice clothes, but there is something wrong with having stuff and thinking that that's all there is in life and not being rich towards God, not having relationship with God. It makes us poor people indeed not to know our Creator. Verse 20, but there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, he's, he's lying outside his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Verse 22. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And so Abraham's bosom is uh, a place that uh, the Bible in other places names uh, Hades. It's a waiting place. It's called another place Paradise. That uh, it's a place where people that believed in God went and they waited for when Jesus went. He, uh, you know, abolished uh, Hades for the righteous. The unrighteous are still in uh, a waiting place, waiting for the final judgments. But the righteous are with Christ and it's far better to be with Christ than just to be waiting. But it was a good place. Okay, it wasn't a bad place. It was a good place. It was a blessed place. But uh, Jesus, uh, when he died, he... Uh, um, took people to be with him to a better place. 
And again, so it was the beggar died, carried by angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried and being in torments in Hades. And so there's a Hades, it's a place of the dead, very simply. And there's a, a good place and there's a bad place in the place of the dead. And uh, being in torments um, in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he might dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. And they're not comforted or tormented because they had a good life or a bad life. They're comforted or tormented because they accepted or rejected God. And beside all this, verse 26, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, that he might testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. So I want to look at a couple of things with you tonight. And firstly, like heaven, hell is a little bit of a mystery. We don't know everything about hell. We don't understand everything about hell. We understand there's a place. And again, the Bible calls it hell. But ultimately, there's a lake of fire that's the, the final judgment. And that's called hell as well. But they're two separate places. This is a waiting place. It's a place of torment. But ultimately, there's a, a final place. And nobody leaves the final place. And nobody leaves the waiting place for the wicked. For the righteous, there was a place that uh, for the Old Testament believers, it was called Abraham's bosom. It was to be in the place of the righteous. It was a good place. It was a place of rest and of peace. And, uh, and, and ultimately, Jesus changed that. And he said, today you'll be with me in paradise. And it's a different place, but it's still a waiting place until the final judgments where we receive our rewards. And there's a new heaven and a new earth. And so they're in, people are in heaven now, but it's a new heaven and new earth to come. So that brings some understanding or some help there. But the world's got an ignorant view about hell like it has about heaven. And two lies about hell that people seem to propagate. There's going to be a great big party there because all, all the sinful things are fun and it's like having a party and, uh, you know, it's all great. But the reality is, is you can go to a party and get drunk, you'll have a hangover in the morning. You can sleep around, but that'll affect your life for the negative in the long term. You can do lots of things. You can be as selfish as you want and enjoy lots of pleasures and not give any regard to God, but it will come back and bite you in the end. That's, that's a reality. And so two lies about hell. One's going to be a great big party. It's going to be a good scene. All the good people are going to hell. All my friends will be there. That's the second lie. It's like, well, it's not going to be a big party. All your friends are not going to be there. They're not going to be anyone's friend when they're there. They're just going to be in torment like you. It's not a big, it's not a great place. And again, consider the comic strip view of hell. You know, I remember looking at a far side uh, cartoon and, and it's like some guy, he's a, um, you know, he's, he's a maestro, he's a, he's a violinist or he's a, a composer or something like that and he's being led by the devil to a little room and he's going to share this little room and there's flames everywhere with a couple of dim-witted rednecks playing banjos. <laughs> and so it, it makes a bit of a joke about that and we can laugh about that but, you know, that the point is, is for some people the world's view hell's a bit of a joke. You know, it's nothing to really worry about because it's not real. You know, it's nothing like the torment Jesus speaks about in this parable. And people, again, the world would want to argue, oh, pastor, you guys are too literal. You take the Bible too literal. It's only a parable. 
And it's like, okay, well, it's only a parable. It's true. It is only a parable. I believe Jesus is illustrating something that he's very aware of and he wants people to be very aware of. In Revelations 20, we understand in Revelations that God opens a door into heaven and gives an understanding to John. It's John's revelation that came by the Spirit of God, by Jesus Christ, and he gives him a revelation also of hell. And he gives him a revelation of future judgments. Listen to what it says, Revelations 20, verse 10. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Doesn't sound like a great place to be, the lake of fire. Verse 11, then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it. And there was found no, uh, sorry, and I saw, verse 12, and I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This is not a parable. This, this is not a story. This is a revelation given to John of heaven and of hell. And we have, as, as I said last week when I talked about heaven, we have a bit of a dim view. We don't properly or clearly see. And uh, in 1 Corinthians 13, 9, it says, Now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. And the ancient mirrors were made out of glass, uh, not made out of glass, but sterling. So they gave a dim view. They gave, like if you look at some stainless steel or something, for example, you can see an image of yourself, but it's not the same as looking at a mirror. And, uh, and so they didn't see clearly. They had a, a, a view that was dim and they had a view that was restricted. And our view of both heaven and hell is a little bit restricted. We don't understand it fully. Maybe you've you know, uh, seen testimony videos of people that have had a, a death or a near-death experience and they have a vision of heaven and or of hell. And uh, they, 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 they tell you it's, it's horrific stuff. They've seen more detail than I I believe some of them are true. I can't prove that, but you know, uh, but it lines up with Scripture many times. And Jesus said this again in John three eleven. Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Jesus knows all about heavenly things. He knows all about hell. He understands all of these things clearly and we struggle to grasp these things and get an understanding of, of the gravity of the situation of heaven and hell and how real it is for people in their lives and people are caught up uh, it's the melbourne cup people are caught up it's their hobby people are caught up with the kids sport or so lots of things aren't necessarily evil that people are focused on in life but the reality is is every one of us steps into eternity the bible says it's appointed once for a man to die, we step into eternity. The Bible says very clearly again and again and again, there is a heaven and there is a hell. So let's look at some truths tonight about hell. And I could talk a lot longer. There's a lot more. We could look right into this in a lot of different things. But I just want to, if you like, skim the surface. And the reason I want to touch on these things tonight and preach on hell as far as and as well as heaven, I'd, I'd prefer to speak about heaven. I'd prefer to focus on heaven. I don't like the idea of hell. It freaks me out. Um, but for me, it is a motivator to tell somebody else yeah. if they're in danger of going to hell and that I would incorporate heaven into uh, you know my witness sometimes, but also I would incorporate as the Holy Spirit leads hell into the witness sometimes because some people won't be enticed into heaven, but they might get scared into heaven. And are you trying to scare me? It's like, absolutely, absolutely. And so like whilst many things are unknowable or unknown or they're mysteries, the word of God is clear on many things. And that's the same with heaven and with hell in uh, John 4. Uh, in, John, in Revelations 4, John sees a door open in heaven and we get a look in through his revelations. We also get a look into hell and see a little bit about that as well. And so some truths about hell. Number one is God is trying to scare us. 
God is purposely painting a picture that's a bad, it's a scary picture because he does not want us to go to hell, which the Bible says was created for the devil and his angels who rebelled against God. And mankind fell into rebellion. And, uh, and as I've said before, like the definition of cancer is a rebellious cell. It's not doing what it was created to do. It's not functioning rightly. It's fu functioning wrongly and it kills the whole body and has an effect. And so ultimately God's going to isolate the rebellious cells, the rebellious people in a place called hell. We know the the story we've seen it in advertising campaigns. You know, there's a you know it's a billboard, or even on the packet of cigarettes, there's a picture of somebody with you know lip cancer, or there's a picture of some black gunk in a in a beaker that's been drained out supposedly of someone's it's, it's cancer and it's tar and nicotine in their lungs, and these things are meant to shock us. And, uh, you know, they're happy to put that on the side of the road and it's like, oh, that's offensive, man, shouldn't do that. And it's No, there's a reason. It wants people to stop smoking. It wants people to understand this will kill you. There's also, you know, uh, advertising, there's photographs and there's even, they went around with schools with damaged motor vehicles to show a, there's a crash, there's an accident, speed kills and we want to get this into the minds of young people so when they get their pee plate and they drive along at 100 kilometres an hour, all this doesn't hurt at all. It hurts if you hit somebody. And so they want people to understand. They want to scare them into... They show someone in, you know, uh, that's become a, a paraplegic or something in an accident or the ambulance is there and they're doing it to shock people for, for a good effect. There's a good reason for that. They're not just playing games. It's not just a horror movie. In life can be a bit of a horror movie, but it's meant to scare you into making better decisions. So it's meant to arrest your attention and get you not to become a statistic in hell, as we read it in the scripture, is similar to that. God doesn't want us to be another statistic, someone else who lived their life without any consideration for God, rejecting the one who rose from the dead and not getting right with their creator. Oh, she'll be right, mate. I'll be okay. I'm a good bloke, you know, is, is the standard thing. And so lung cancer is real. Broken bodies are real. You know, broken lives are real. Car wrecks are real. And hell is real. And Jesus is trying to get through to the Pharisees who had ridiculed and mocked his teaching. They weren't listening to Christ, even though he came down from heaven. And they were religious experts in their own mind. But the, the truth is, they were the blind leading the blind. They had no clue. And most people have no clue. Second truth about hell is, just as there's a feast in heaven, there'll be a famine in hell. It's not, a, it's not a party. There'll be no party food there. Revelation 19, 9, blessed are those who are called to the marriage uh, supper of the Lamb. There's, there's a, there's a, there is a party, but it's in heaven. It's not in hell. And, uh, and I gave the testimony last week, you know, of uh, my boss's uh, boyfriend came to our wedding and he's stuffing prawns in his mouth. He's saying, this is a good wedding. This is a good banquet. This is a good feed. And uh, he's having a good time. And the Bible says there's going to be a wedding of Christ and the church. And it's the marriage supper of the Lamb. And it's going to be an awesome thing. Hell's the opposite of that. Verse 23, And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. It doesn't sound like he's having a great time, does it? It doesn't sound like there's a whole lot of, you know, drink machines there. It doesn't sound like there's a whole lot of party food going on at all. He wants a, a, a drip of water uh, from the, the finger of, of a, 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 you know, a leprous beggar that used to live at his gate. He says, for I am tormented in this flame. Hell's serious. Hell's heavier than we could ever imagine. A third thing that's true in, in hell as I mentioned last week, in heaven there's no more tears, but in hell there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In heaven there's no weeping, there's no crying, there's no more tears. In hell there is and gnashing of teeth. I don't know if you've ever been in, in enough pain that you're still literally, ah, 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 and you're in pain and you're, and you're grinding your teeth and you're gnashing your teeth. In heaven, in uh, Revelations 21, 4, it talks about heaven. It says, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. 
There shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. There's nothing to cry about. All things are new. There's, there's, there, you know, there's no sickness there. There's no brokenness. There's no cancer. There's no, no, uh, you know, bad relationships there. There's no offences. There's no hurts. There's no crying in heaven. But in hell, Matthew 25, 30 says, And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so it paints this picture of, of just horror, of, of, of weeping and gnashing of teeth and torment in the flame. And, 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 and uh, I can't get any satisfaction. Just a drop of water might help a little bit. The fourth thing, there, there appears that there are levels of suffering in hell. It appears that there's levels of suffering, just like there's different levels in a prison, depending on the crime committed, and just like there's different rewards in heaven, depending on what we've done. Hell appears to have different punishments, but all of them are bad. It's not really as if you're going to go to minimum security and have a TV and a nice cafeteria there for you. It's, it's still torment in heaven. Matthew 25, 21, His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. But in hell, Revelation twenty thirteen, Death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. There's a judgment and they were judged according to their works. And just as the Bible speaks of Paul's revelation of the third heaven and other places mentioned the highest heaven, etc., there seems like there's different levels in hell. Deuteronomy 32, 22, For a fire is kindled in my anger and shall burn to the lowest hell. The living Bible says, My anger is kindled a fire that burns to the depths of the underworld. There's depth, there's different levels of depth, I believe, in hell, just as there is in heaven. There's just a difference there. And the final thing is that hell is not where you want to end up. Hell is not where you want to end up. That's the truth about hell. Proverbs 7, 27, talking about the wayward woman, talking about the, uh, the harlot. It says, her house is the way to hell, descending to the chambers of death. And the word chamber there is literally an enclosed or an inner room. And so here's this picture of hell, this picture of that there's, there's an enclosed inner room that you're going to be, if you like, in a prison cell in hell. In heaven, John, Je, John speaks, Jesus speaks these words, John 14, 2, In my Father's house are many mansions. I think I'd rather be in a mansion in heaven than a chamber of death in hell. And beside all this, between, no, on, whoop, if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. In heaven there's mansions, in hell there's enclosed rooms, a place of darkness, a place of flame, a place of torment. In our text, it's clear that there's no way out of there. You can't get prayed out of there, you can't pay the priest or pay the pastor to offer up some sort of prayers for you to get you out of hell or purgatory or wherever you're supposed to be. Purgatory is not in the Bible anyway. But it says he's comforted and you, he, he is comforted and you are tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. There's, there's, there's no escape. There's no change of the circumstance. It's appointed once for a man to die and then the judgment. There's nothing you can do after that. And so think about it for a moment. Hell's a place you just don't want to go to. You just don't want to find yourself there. Talks about torment. Talks about suffering. Talks about darkness. Talks about flames. Talks about weeping. Talks about gnashing of teeth. It talks about begging for a drop of water. And it doesn't sound like a party with all of your mates to me. Hell is not a place where you want to end up. 
That was not a place where we want to go. And so therefore, I preach all of this and I believe and I hope that uh, everyone here is like, no, we're not going to help us. We're going to heaven and we're thankful. Praise God for that. That's our focus. That's where we got the GPS set for. Where that's, that's the route that we're on. God has sent Jesus and his blood has cleansed us of our sin. He gave his life for our life. We're redeemed. We're forgiven. We have a whole new life. We're born again by the power of God. Our names are written in heaven. He's preparing a place for us, thank God. But the truth is, a lot of people, that's not true for them. And so maybe it's something that's sobering with regard to others, not just ourselves. We don't need the incentive ourselves. We're already on the way to heaven and, you know, uh, hell's a scary place. We understand that. We're not going there. But, there, you know, there's other people besides that. There's hope in heaven and there's no hope in hell. This is what it says here, his believers in Romans chapter 8. For we know that the whole creation groans and labours with birth pangs together until now. We know it's a, a fallen world, it's a broken world, it's, it, it's like birth pains. We're getting squeezed, there's pressures that come upon our life, there's pressures going on between nations, in, inside of families and in the workplace, you name it, there's all sorts of problems going on in the world that we live in. There's spiritual powers and principalities. There's all sorts of stuff going on in the world that we live in. There's sickness, there's death, there's all of, the, all of these things. But listen to what it says. For we know the whole creation groans and labours with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. We want to go to heaven. It's far better. It's like, thank God we can go to heaven. Thank God that this life is not all that there is and the struggles of this life is not all that there is. There's a heaven to go to. Thank God. It says, verse 24, For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly await for it. With perseverance. There's perseverance required. We're going to heaven, but it's still a bit tough on the way. It's still a bit difficult down here on planet Earth. There's still problems going on. The creation hasn't given birth to what we want to see give uh, birth, and that is the eradication of evil and the, the, the redemption of our lives so that we become like Christ and we become righteous and perfect like Him all the time. And so, yes, we live in a broken world, but we have hope. For unbelievers, this is what it says, Revelations 9, 20 and 21. The gospel's being preached in all the earth. People have opportunity to be saved. God's bringing judgment upon the earth. It's the end times. And yet people still are hanging on to their selfish pleasures and their selfish sins and their hopes in things that there's no hope in. Uh, and listen to what it says, but the Revelations 9, 20, but the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. But there's no hope of heaven, there's no hope. And so we might as well just steal some stuff. We might as well just be immoral. We might as well, you know, try and call out to some guys. Hey, hey, you know, if we reject Christ, who else is there? And people are trying to find somewhere, but there's no hope. And there's only hope as the here and now, which simply runs out. The here and now doesn't continue on forever. In our text, the rich man begs for someone to testify to his five brothers. And the someone in the story is Lazarus. Can, can he go? Because Lazarus, he knows about heaven and hell. He knows about the, the final destination as being either a really good or a really bad place. And he said, he needs to go because he can speak with conviction. He can convince them. He can make a difference. And I say that to say this, maybe because we know, maybe we can speak with conviction. Maybe we can speak words of life to people that can turn their life around, that they can be rescued from hell. And he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers that he may testify to them lest they come to this place of torment. If he could go there himself, he would, but he can't. He's not allowed. And he's saying, please, can he go? I know I can't go, but can he go? And, and again, 
Abraham says, no, it, that's not possible either. Even if someone were to be raised from the dead, they still wouldn't believe. They still have the law and the prophets. And the Bible says the law is like a schoolmaster or a teacher to bring us to Christ. And so what he's saying there, what the Bible's saying there is that the law of God that the Bible says is written on our hearts. We know by our conscience that we've sinned. We know we've broken God's laws. We all know that. And that's meant to bring us to Christ. When we hear about Christ, it's like, yes, I need a saviour. I know I've done wrong. I need a saviour. I, I, I need forgiveness because I'm convicted of my sin. The law that God has put in my heart, the law that's affected my conscience has taught me that I'm not right with God and I need a saviour. And so I have a choice then. And Abraham says that should be enough. That should convince people. But he says even if someone rises from the dead and Jesus did, people still don't listen to that. They're not listening to their conscience. They're not listening to Christ. But there are people that will be saved. And God has got people for us to reach. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they'll repent. But he said, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded that one rise from the dead. You know, many people, they won't respond, as I said, to the law, the conviction of being a lawbreaker, to the conviction of conscience, to bring them to Christ. And uh, the law and the conviction of the Holy Ghost, it teaches people their need for a saviour. And not all are going to be persuaded, but some will be persuaded. Some will come close. Some will make it across the line. Think about King Agrippa in Acts 26, 28. He says to Paul, you almost persuade me. To become a Christian. You almost persuade me, but Paul persuaded many people. Some people totally rejected him and the message he brought. Some people were almost persuaded and some people were fully persuaded and they gave their life to Christ and their life was turned around and they averted hell and their names were written in heaven. And so as I close tonight, God's desire is that nobody would go to hell. God's desire is that none would go there. It was created for the devil and his angels, not for mankind. But man sinned and rebelled and man continues to sin and rebel. And God's desire, he's broken hearted about that. His desire is not that they'd go to hell. God will bring a judgment and it's a righteous judgment, but that's not his heart's desire. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3 and 4. I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers will come mocking the truth and following their own desires. They will say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? And in verse 9 of that chapter, it says, The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. Let's bow our heads before God tonight. He wants everyone to repent. There is a, a heaven and there is a hell. And the reality is it's your option. It's your opportunity. It's your decision to make heaven or make hell your home. And the Bible says that uh, it's appointed once for a man to die then the judgment. The Bible says that there were none righteous, no, not one, that all have sinned and fallen short. And the Bible says very clearly that the way to heaven is through the door and Jesus said that I am the door, I am the way to the Father. No one comes to the Father except through me because Jesus and Jesus alone gave his life as a sacrifice to fulfill the judgment of the law, which is that the soul that sins will surely die. And Jesus died in our place so that we could be forgiven. That's the heart of God. That's who God is. His desire, he's, he's going to judge sin. He's going to judge the cancer of sin. He's going to judge what people do. But he gives an opportunity through his son, Jesus. He desires that all would be saved. And maybe you're here tonight and you need to be saved. You need to be right with God. It's not through your church attendance. It's not through helping people across the road. It's not through giving out some relief or helping in some way. All those things are good. But it won't save you. You must be born again. And that's something that only God can do. And the Bible says if you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and confess 
with your mouth, you will be saved. And so I want to give you an opportunity tonight. You're in this place and you're not a Christian. You're not living as a Christian. You're not right with God. You have no assurance of heaven. And in reality, you have a fear of hell. You can find the peace of God right here, right now. You can pray a simple prayer. God, forgive me, a sinner. Believe Jesus died in my place. Jesus come into my life and he will. He came into my life in a service just like this. I heard a simple message just like this. Jesus died on Calvary's cross for my sin. Personal. And I prayed the prayer. I said, God, if that's true, I need to save him. I need to be forgiven. I want to make heaven my home. And I prayed a simple prayer and Jesus came into my life. And began a work in my life that continues to this day. Wonderful God. And I'm saved by the grace of God. Through the love of God. The Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Jesus. That whosoever would believe in him. That's, who, that's me. That's you. That's, that's anybody. Can have eternal life. Can have forgiveness of sin. And so tonight... You want to pray a prayer like that? You want to pray a real simple prayer? God, forgive me, a sinner. Jesus, come into my life. You like to pray a prayer like that? You can lift your hand to signify that tonight. Pastor, that's me. I need to be saved. I need what Jesus did for me. I need Jesus Christ in my life. I want to receive him. I want to take that offer, that, that gift of forgiveness. I want to take it for myself tonight. And I want to pray a prayer. That's you tonight. You, you want to pray a prayer, you can lift your hand to signify that. Have someone pray with you tonight. Count it a pleasure and a joy to pray with you tonight. Maybe you're here tonight once upon a time. You, you know this is true and you prayed a prayer and you followed Christ, but you've wandered, you've walked away. You've turned your back on him. He's calling you back. He's knocking on the door of your heart and he wants you to open your heart and say, God, I've, I've turned my back on you and I've walked away, but I'm turning back to you tonight. I want to make a fresh commitment to you, Jesus. And that's you tonight. You'd like to pray that prayer. Is anybody here tonight? That's you. I want to pray a prayer like that. I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. And I know that Jesus is the difference in my relationship with him. I want to pray a prayer. Wonderful God. Give you an opportunity tonight just to spend some time in prayer. Jesus has seen hell and he's seen heaven. And he came to save us from hell and take us to heaven. The truth about heaven is it's a real place and the truth about hell is that it's a real place. And thank God that we can go and we know that we can go to heaven. Thank God we're not going to hell but there's others that we can reach. Maybe God's put somebody on your heart tonight and you want to take time and pray for them. Maybe you want to say, God, give me wisdom and boldness in my witness when to speak about things like heaven and things like hell because you know, if, if you've just got a you know machine gun sort of witnessing style and it's, it's all this or it's all that, we need sensitivity to the Holy Ghost. And we need a simple gospel message that can save and people can be delivered from the power of darkness and the power of hell. The devil wants to take people to hell with him. Jesus wants to take people to heaven with him. And many times you and me, we, we make a difference. Our witness makes a difference. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Give you an opportunity to pray tonight. The altar's open. I invite you to come. Spend some time in prayer. Thank you, my God, for your goodness. Thank you, my God, for your great love. Thank you, my God, for your mighty power, Lord God. It's real, God. Stirring our heart, Lord God. Thankful, Father, tonight. God, help us, God, to be moved by your spirit, by your presence, Lord God. God, you looked and you said, who can I send? And, uh, Father, we can say, here am I, Lord, send me. God, I'll speak on your behalf. God, I'll make a difference that someone can be saved. Oh, Father God, we thank you, God. You haven't held back the truth, God. Just as the advertisers didn't hold back the truth, Lord, about cancer and about speeding in cars and different things. God, I'm thankful for these truths. They're harsh truths, Lord, but they're real. God, I thank you haven't held back the truth about hell and the truth about heaven. God, stir our heart by the Holy Ghost right now, I pray. God, minister your presence at this altar, Lord God. I 
gives insight into spiritual things tonight, Lord God. But let us be moved, God, by your Holy Spirit, God. Give us conviction, Father. Wonderful Saviour Jesus, thank you that you gave yourself. You humbled yourself and came as a man, sinful man. Gave your life on the cross for us to redeem us from the power of darkness, the power of sin and death. Thank you, Jesus, you came to destroy those things and deliver us to heaven. Our witness to be powerful, to make a difference. Thank God for heaven. Thank God that it's a real place. Thank God that we're going to go there. But hell's a real place too. And God wants to use us to make a difference for somebody. Just as somebody made a difference for us. I thank God for the whole counsel of God. I'll know the truth. The truth will set you free. The truth will give you right balance and perspective and understanding. And uh, wonderful God. Wonderful God. 
Just remind you, Friday, we're going to fast on Friday. <coughs> Praise God, we're going to fast on Friday. Break the fast after the uh, prayer meeting at the, uh, at the home group Bible study. Praise God. It's going to be a good day. We're going to see a uh, breakthrough. We're praying for others. We're praying for ourselves. We're praying for situations. We're praying for the, the power of God to come down and touch people's lives, open people's ears and eyes to the gospel. And uh, whatever help we need as well, we're going to pray for that. We're going to contend for that. Can I say amen? Praise God. We're going to close off in a word of prayer. Appreciate you coming out tonight. Can we get uh, Josh to pray for us tonight? Father God, we do thank you of eternity in heaven and hell, God. We thank you for this message tonight, God, and this reminder of what you've blessed us from, God. I pray that you would seal this word in our hearts tonight and bring it, uh, God, with us and bring us back safely on Sunday. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you tonight. God bless you.